USA Today has just announced its Women of the Year and Assistant Secretary of Health Richard Levine has made the list. You go, girl. This is one small step for a man and one giant leap backward for women. The message here in Philadelphia, in Love Park, is that trans rights are human rights. You have worth. You have tremendous worth just for who you are, no matter who you love, no matter who you are, no matter what your gender identity, sexual orientation, or anything else. And to be true to that, and then everything else will follow. And it highlights something which I truly believe in, which is the value of diversity. Diversity is just so important in our culture. It's important for our country, for the world. Now say what you will about Mr. Levine. He certainly adds diversity to the list of women of the year. But his message doesn't make a lot of sense. His message, the whole headline of the article in USA Today is be true to yourself. But transgenderism does precisely the opposite of that. It encourages people to be dishonest with themselves, to lie to themselves and to everybody else, to pretend that reality is different than it really is. Mr. Levine may or may not be a nice guy. He might be a friendly neighbor. He might be a good cook. I don't know. The only thing that I do know about Richard Levine is that he is not true to himself. Our society is now so divorced from truth that we call men women. We call abortion health care. We call criminals victims. Richard Levine is one very confused man. But what's our excuse? I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from Nosferatu and Friends who says Biden shuts down pipeline construction. Biden, two years later. Don't blame me. That pipeline was two years away from completion. This is a great point. This is one of the aspects of the whole Keystone pipeline debate that is least talked about. One of the Democrat talking points is, no, you can't blame high gas prices and rising energy costs on us shutting down the Keystone pipeline. That was two years away from completion. Two years is not a long time, and two years is priced into oil and gas prices, and if they had just let the damn thing be built, we'd almost be finished with it by now. Really, really frustrating. And then we could just sit down and rest easy. When you want to sit down and rest easy, I would strongly recommend you check out Allform. Right now, head on over to allform.com slash Knowles. You know Helix makes these phenomenal mattresses. Well, they've left the bedroom and started making sofas. They just launched a new company called Allform, and they are already making the greatest sofas ever. They're phenomenal. What makes them so great? Well, it's the easiest way you can customize a sofa using premium materials. Do you want cloth? Do you want leather? You can do whatever, really high quality stuff at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. You pick the fabric, the color, the color of the legs, the sofa size, the shape. You make sure it's the perfect fit for your home. They've got armchairs and love seats. You can go all the way up to an eight seat sectional. So there's something for everyone. And you can start small and then add on as your family and your home grow. Really, really top quality. You are not going to see this quality for this price anywhere else. It's super easy assembly. It's brought directly to your door. No tools needed. To find your perfect sofa, go to allform.com slash Knowles. Allform is offering 20% off all orders for our listeners. Allform.com slash Knowles. One, one giant leap back toward the most ancient, bizarre, pagan, occult ideologies. <laughs> Transgenderism. That is what Mr. Levine's selection as one of the women of the year suggests. Women are having a really hard go of it. And the worst part is women think that all of the damage that has been done to them in society is actually some form of progress. I saw this just the other day. The other day was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's birthday. The late Supreme Court Justice RBG, uh, there, there was a tweet that went viral about RBG's birthday that really epitomized, I think, feminist delusion. This person said, today would have been Ruth Bader Ginsburg's 89th birthday. She spent her life empowering women And now we are a force to be reckoned with. Now, you know, before 
that justice lady who was appointed in the 90s before, women not empowered. Women could do nothing. They were completely useless, totally oppressed. And then after the early 1990s, after Ruth Bader Ginsburg, now they're, now they're so empowered that men are taking all of their jobs. And I'm, when I say women's jobs, I'm not saying the jobs in the office places that women have come to take on over the years. I mean, men have now taken the job of being women. Even that is not available to women anymore uh, because the men have taken it. What did Ruth Bader Ginsburg do to help women? Nothing. You can't even say that she broke the glass ceiling. Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't even the first female Supreme Court justice. That was Sandra Day O'Connor, appointed by Ronald Reagan. What did Ruth Bader Ginsburg do? She voted with the court's liberals on a bunch of cases, and that's it. And that's all she did. The most interesting thing the woman did in her life was be friends with Antonin Scalia. That was it. She did not change the position of women. Moreover, the position of women has not improved. I, I saw this tweet and some people criticized it. And they said, what are you talking about? What, what did Ruth Bader Ginsburg do? You know, I think women were a force to be reckoned with before the 90s. I think there have been pretty impressive women throughout history, like, uh, I don't know, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the Virgin Mary, Joan of Arc, Marie Curie, for that matter. I, there have been a lot of women, right, who have done things in this world. And it, it, it didn't all begin with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So someone said, well, no, Michael, what you don't understand is before they were applying this to Ruth Ginsburg, which didn't make sense. But let's just say before the last 50 or so years, women didn't have lots of the rights that they now enjoy. Rights such as, and I'm quoting one of the responses, the, the right to divorce, the right to work, the right to access birth control and abortion. Now, None of those things are exactly rights. First of all, women always worked. It's true that now women have more opportunities to go work in the widget factory like men do. Women have the wonderful right to go do spreadsheets for some other guy and waste away their lives. That's true. They, they do have that right. Girl power, way to go. Uh, but what about these other rights? The right to, to birth control. Women now have the right for men to use them for sex and throw them away like they're worthless. They have that right now. Ha ha, that'll show you patriarchy. Women have the right to divorce and have their husbands leave them without any consequences or accountability whatsoever. Yeah, all right, girl power. Women have the right to kill their children. Yes, women, that'll, that'll empower you. That'll make you feel good about yourself. That will, of course, it's not a right at all. There's no right to do that whatsoever. I take social science with a grain of salt but I will cite the statistics when they back up my opinion. Okay, I'll be totally forthright about that. I, I think most social science is bogus and unreliable, but I am more than happy to cite the left's own statistics when it serves my purpose. And on the question of female happiness, the statistics are very clear. Since second wave feminism, since all of these rights, quote unquote, came into place that all of these feminists are quoting, women have become less happy both relative to men and in absolute terms. So it's not even just like everyone got less happy, men got less happy too, sure. But even relative to men, women got much less happy. And now women aren't even allowed to be women. Now men are allowed to be women and the category of women is no longer said to exist. Women lost their bathrooms. Women lost their locker rooms. Women lost their sport, sports leagues. Women have lost pretty much everything, all in the name of progress. If that's progress, if that's achievement, I think maybe you've got to check your premises. This issue here of abortion, as some right, it's now sort of the sacrament of the left. It's the most sacred, quote unquote, right on the left. It's why they go so crazy every time Roe versus Wade is threatened. It, it does not lead to human flourishing. Obviously, it kills the baby, but it's really bad for women too. Evan Rachel Wood, showed me this. The actress Evan Rachel Wood is in this new documentary about Marilyn Manson. She dated Marilyn Manson, the most famous Satanist in America. And it turns out he's apparently not a great guy. Uh, you might be shocked by that. Turns out everyone's parents in the 1990s was right. The, the really famous Satanist is kind of a weirdo and, and kind of cruel and kind of sadistic. And although their romantic relationship was consensual, sort of. Uh, he still subjected this young actress to all sorts of terrible things. And one of the, one of the things that she alleges he subjected her to was he uh, would not 
use uh, a condom. He would not let her take the birth control pill. She became pregnant and he pressured her to go get an abortion. This Evan Rachel Wood cites as one of the most traumatic events in her life. But why is it traumatic? I thought this was a great right to be celebrated. I thought this was the most important sacred constitutional right that we all need to stand up for. Well, Evan Rachel Wood tries to square that circle. She says, I obviously believe in a woman's right to choose, but that doesn't mean it wasn't devastating. And after she got the abortion, she was so depressed, she became suicidal and she actually tried to kill herself. I have no doubt that that's true. I know women, I know a number of women who have had abortions and it has really, really messed them up. Why? Why? That's the next question that Evan Rachel Wood has to ask herself. I believe in a woman's right to choose, but I was devastated. Why were you devastated? Because you killed your child, because it's so obviously wrong that no amount of ideology can convince you otherwise. No amount of ideology can suppress that nagging voice, which is your conscience, which is telling you that you've done something really awful. Now, there is redemption. There is a way out of this, okay? There is the possibility of salvation. But you've got to acknowledge that what you did was wrong, and she seems unwilling to do that. She says, I obviously believe in a woman's right to choose. Why do you believe in that? It made you suicidal. Because of this so-called right, you tried to kill yourself because you exercised that right. Maybe it's not a right. Maybe, maybe you were sold a bill of goods by an ideology that has made you miserable, has made your culture coarser, and has made your country so confused that it can no longer tell the difference between men and women. We've got to protect our communities, including the most local community, the household, which is why you got to check out Ring. Right now, go to ring.com slash Knowles. You know about Ring's video doorbell. I've told you about it for years. You know about Ring Alarm. I've even mentioned Ring Alarm, this award-winning security system with available professional monitoring when you subscribe. Amazing system where you can easily install it yourself. Well, you might not know that recently I've gone pro. I have gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro. Ring Alarm Pro is just the next level. It is the top shelf. CNET calls Ring Alarm Pro a giant leap for home security. After using it, you're going to see exactly what we're talking about. Ring Alarm Pro helps protect the entire home and the Wi-Fi it runs on. With Ring Alarm Pro, Ring combined a home security system and a Wi-Fi router. So it protects your home and your network, your physical world, your virtual world. Uh, I, I can't recommend this enough. I love Ring. It makes me feel more secure. Now it makes me feel more secure digitally as well as physically for my family when I'm on the road. When we're all on the road, protects the home from freeze, fire, flood. It's just tremendous. Go learn more at ring.com slash Knowles. Do not wait. Ring.com slash Knowles. Speaking of violence, we have an update from criminal justice reform. You know, I've been doing these sort of regular updates on criminal justice reform because we are told the, the worst problem in America is over-incarceration and the criminals are the real victims and we've got to focus on what we as a society have done to force these people to commit these crimes. So I want to see how this is going because what we were told was if we go softer on the criminals and we let them out of prison and we let them get away with their crimes, then things will improve. The crime rate will go down. We'll all live in harmony. We'll sing Kumbaya and play in drum circles together. So has that happened? Uh, no. Uh, in one of the latest attacks, a brutal and unprovoked attack, a, a young man, relatively young man, 40-year-old man, was caught on surveillance footage at a Seattle subway station grabbing a 62-year-old woman, Kim Hayes, and throwing her down a flight of cement steps. Uh, this was at the Chinatown International District Station. Hayes, this 62-year-old woman, is a nurse. She's worked at, at a nurse for a long time. She was going in to this hospital to work. And then around noontime, so broad daylight, right, right at lunch, this guy comes up, flings her down a flight of cement stairs, well, how could we have predicted this? Look, Michael, crime happens, okay? You're not going to, you sound just as utopian as the left. There's no way to prevent all crime. That's true, but I think I could have predicted this one because this guy, Alexander J, has been convicted 
22 times of crimes in Washington state and California. And it wasn't insider trading, okay? We're not talking about white collar crimes here. We're talking about violent crimes. He was convicted of burglary, theft, selling stolen property, drug possession, auto theft, multiple counts of domestic violence. Well, Michael, maybe that was all in his past. Don't you think people deserve a second chance? I believe in second chances. I don't believe in 20 second chances. But maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe he paid his debt to society. Oh no, it was just last year. He was just last year convicted of a residential burglary. He's been issued more than 15 bench warrants since 2016 by Washington courts, and he failed to attend his court hearings. This guy should not be allowed in society. Forget after the 22nd offense, or the 21st, after the third offense. What do they say in baseball? One, two, 22 strikes, you're out. No, three strikes, you're out. If this guy is going to keep committing all of these offenses, at the very least, he has to be locked away forever from society. At the very least. That's the, that's the most moderate punishment I could imagine. It's not good for him. He's out there doing horrible things to other people and to himself. He's not living a flourishing life. He's harming himself, his soul, probably his body. And for what? He's going to end up back in jail. They're probably going to let him out. And he's going to go throw another 60-year-old woman down the stairs. Criminal justice. There it is. There's, there's our over-incarceration problem. There are these poor, beleaguered criminals. Our problem, we're just too tough on these guys. He never had a chance. No, the 62-year-old woman never had a chance because you let these animals run around society after 22 prior convictions. It's not, it's not just one or two incidences. We've got a guy in Yonkers. Guy in Yonkers, New York. That's a town just north of New York City. Guy in Yonkers. Here's the New York Times story from this attack up in Yonkers. Man hit woman in the head 125 times because she was Asian, officials say. 67, 67 year old woman wearing a white face mask and dark hooded jacket and pushing a shopping cart enters an apartment building in Yonkers, New York. As she moves to unlock the door, a man comes up behind her and hits her in the head with a roundhouse right hand. The force of the blow knocks the woman to the ground. As she lies there, her attacker bends down and pummels her repeatedly with both hands for the next minute. More than 125 blows altogether. He then stomps on her seven times and spits on her before walking away. This is one of the most appalling attacks I have ever seen, says John J. Muller, the Yonkers police commissioner. To beat a helpless woman is despicable. Targeting her because of his race makes it more so. Absolutely right. So this guy was just a totally unpredictable one-off attack, right? There was nothing we could have possibly done to stop this. Crime happens and, oh no, he had 14 previous arrests, half of them on felony charges, according to the Yonkers police, convicted of assault in 2011, sentenced to just over three years in prison, released on parole after two and a half, because he's such a good guy. Uh, then he was released in October 2013, according to state prison records. And then he just keeps committing crimes. Why was this animal let out of prison? Because of compassion, because he's the real victim. And the woman who almost got murdered by this savage well, she's, you know, she's just kind of part of the system, the institution, the society. And boy, didn't that society fail this poor man? Gosh, we got to do something about all this over-incarceration. This leads to not just bad outcomes for the victims and for the individual, at least to bad outcomes for the society, for the whole community. I think of what's one of the worst towns in America right now, San Francisco. And the crazy part about that is in San Francisco right now, the city, which is falling into just mayhem and drugs everywhere, human feces on the street, the cost of living is impossible still somehow. San Francisco is boycotting the rest of the United States. What does that even mean? I saw the headline. I said, I don't even know what that means. Well, there was a March 4th memo that went out from the city administrator, Carmen Chu, that shows that San Francisco will not enter into contracts with businesses headquartered in most of the United States. That includes 28 states. They won't do this uh, because those states have what San Francisco deems to be anti-LGBT laws. And by anti-LGBT laws, sometimes that just means they won't let dudes go into the little girl's locker room. But because of these laws, San Francisco is boycotting the states. 
official travel to those states is forbidden. Now, I bet official travel to African countries that throw, or Middle Eastern countries that throw gay guys off of rooftops, I bet that that's not officially prohibited in any of the state laws. But traveling to, I don't know, Georgia, traveling to, actually some, traveling to Nevada, traveling to New Hampshire, North Carolina, Wisconsin, prohibited if you're in San Francisco. They can't ink these deals. Countries cannot behave like this. Okay, this is, this is not, I guess this is the conclusion of radical individualism. Because some people will say, well, San Francisco can do whatever San Francisco wants. But I don't believe that. San Francisco is a city in the United States. And if you're a city, if you're a state in the United States, you can't just boycott the rest of the United States. Then you don't have a country. Okay, we've got to work together. We have to have some things in common. We've got to work toward the common good. That's what a republic is, is you hold things in common and you work to better those things. You work to better the whole society by working on your common good. Real countries don't behave like this, but real countries know the difference between men and women. So we are pretty far through the looking glass. So is there any hope? Is there any hope that we can have some standards that we all agree on? I believe it's possible. Representative Thomas Massey, great GOP representative, and 16 other House Republicans are suing the CDC over its mask mandate on flights. You know, the the libs want to convince you that COVID is over, but it's not really over. They've kept their emergency, national emergency authorization. They've kept the masks on flights. They're keeping the ability to spin this thing up just after the midterm elections. So 17 GOP members led by Thomas Massey are suing the CDC and they're making two claims. They say, first, none of the statutes or regulations cited by the CDC for the authority to mandate that individuals wear masks on commercial airlines, conveyances, and in transportation hubs permit the CDC to implement or enforce this mandate. So none of the laws that the CDC is citing as giving them this power actually gives them this power. And then two, Massey says, even if Congress had granted the CDC the authority to promulgate the mask mandate, the granting of this authority would violate a principle known as the non-delegation doctrine. So he's saying, even if the CDC could cite laws, the Congress doesn't have the right to outsource to the CDC a rule requiring you all to muzzle yourselves every time you go on public transit. I don't know the legal arguments for or against his point on the non-delegation doctrine, but his first point seems absolutely clear to me. The CDC simply does not have these rights. And yet that's what they're citing. The only way that we are ever going to get back to a more, to a more coherent kind of country is if we take this power back. They're not going to give it voluntarily. You actually have the president of the United States right now. He had a little bit of a faux pas. He was speaking the other day and he said that the the husband of the first lady has COVID. I was going to say, look look at this stage, but that's enough too. Look at the stage. (laughs) But there's been a little change in the arrangement of who's on the stage because of the first lady's husband uh, contracting COVID. But uh, look at this room and what you see. Pardon That's right. She's fine. It's me. (laughs) That's not together. The second lady, the first gentleman. How about that? Anyway. Ah, the husband of the first lady. That's you. That's you, you old pudding head. uh, Huh? Oh, right. Who is the, who am I thinking? Oh, the vice president. Her... Husband, has, I don't know what's going on. Uh, one, is it any surprise that Vladimir Putin and our enemies around the world are attacking, that this guy doesn't know what end is up. He doesn't even know who he is. But two, they're going to keep using COVID. <laughs> they're going to keep doing it. We're, they're telling us COVID's over. Don't worry. We're not going to wear the mask. We're not going to do this. And he says, oh, we're a little social distanced here because someone who's related to someone in the administration has COVID. They are champing at the bit to use this COVID stuff again. They're just trying to get through the midterms. Do not let them. This is a once in a generation chance to take away the power seized by parts of the government. Take it back for the people. Restore our American way of life. Do not let that chance pass you by. All right, protect yourself. Protect your identity. 
your national and personal identity with LifeLock. Do not wait a minute. Right now, go to lifelock.com slash Knowles. The tax filing deadline is right around the corner. With it brings IRS scammers looking to steal your money and your personal information. The most common scams take place on the phone or via email. Be smart. Do not give information out or send money to anyone over the phone. Always ask for everything in writing and only interact with websites that end with .gov. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives every day, especially this time of year. We are putting information at risk on the internet in an instant. You won't even know it happened. A cybercriminal could steal what's yours, sometimes even harm your finances and your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats, such as your social security number for sale on the dark web. You have access to a dedicated restoration specialist if you become a victim. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can help protect what's yours with LifeLock by Norton. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year at LifeLock.com slash Knowles. That is LifeLock.com slash Knowles for 25% off. We've also got something really special. We've been working on this for months. It is out now, specifically today, to celebrate the two-year celebrate, to commemorate, to bemoan the two-year anniversary of two weeks to slow the spread. Uh, This would be a documentary series that we've worked on on Dr. Fauci. It's called Fauci Unmasked. It is available right now at The Daily Wire. Your humble host leads you through the untold story of Dr. Fauci going all the way back to the 1980s, trying to answer this question, how did this guy attain power? It's a three-part series. We're going to drop episode one today. We're going to drop episode two tomorrow. We're going to drop episode three on Friday. For a while, I actually thought, oh, they're going to get Fauci out of the news. Ever since I launched my public health protection pledge, ever since Fauci had a lot of members of Congress and congressional candidates coming on saying, we're going to fire Fauci this year. This is going to be a big campaign issue. You'll notice all of a sudden, Fauci just disappeared. He basically went into the witness protection program. Democrats realized he was really hurting their numbers. Do not let this guy get away with it. We are not doing it. Just just yesterday, Rand Paul came out and proposed an amendment to get rid of Dr. Fauci's position. We've got uh, Congressman Paul Gosar in the House of Representatives supporting uh, my pledge to say that Dr. Fauci will have his uh, salary zeroed out and that he will be investigated. They're waiting to do this after November. Don't let them get away with it. Check out the trailer. He's the highest paid employee in our federal government. And beginning in the spring of 2020, Dr. Fauci began to set national policy that affected the way that 330 million Americans lived their lives. For goodness sakes, I'm telling you, wear a mask, keep social distancing. There's nothing political about that. But who is Anthony Fauci? People who have conspiracy theories, those are people that don't particularly care for me. In this short series, we will do what the establishment media have refused to do. We will give you an unvarnished look at the career of the most powerful politician in America, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Don't you think it's time that you step down and let someone else who has a more effective message? (laughs) Actually, no. (laughs) Go check out Fauci Unmasked. It's available exclusively at The Daily Wire. If you are not a member yet, head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe to join. Also, Daily Wire's got its first book coming out, 12 Seconds in the Dark, by Sergeant Mattingly. Tells the true story of what happened the night of the Breonna Taylor shooting. It's available now on Amazon or anywhere you buy books, so go get your copy today. It is certain to sell out. We will be right back with a lot more. There is a story that has nothing to do with Russia, has nothing to do with COVID, has nothing to do with crime, has nothing to do with the economy. And it is a story that I love. It's one of those rare little glimmers of light and hope in our culture. And it's coming from Ralph Lauren, the the clothing maker, the sort of Americana clothing maker. Ralph Lauren has just unveiled a fashion line for historically black colleges and universities. I love this. I think this is so great. Now, 
some people are going to hear that and say, oh, this is going to be some woke thing. They're going to focus on identity politics and it's black identity and it's going to be the same old woke stuff we've always heard. That is not what is going on here. The most jarring aspect, I guess, given the fact that we live in this crazy identitarian world, the most jarring aspect of Ralph Lauren's new clothing line for historically black colleges and universities is that it's no different from Ralph Lauren's clothing line for any other college and university, and it's no different than all the other clothes that he makes. It's a kind of traditional American, slightly preppy, really put together clothing line. You can see all, all the photos. They launched the campaign yesterday. I absolutely love this because what this campaign is saying is that black people are just like other people. They're not, they're not some different species that needs to be treated totally differently. You could see a lesser fashion designer going in and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to design clothing for black people. And so, you know, we're going to design pants that have to be worn at your ankles and we're going to design really overpriced sneakers and we're going to design, I don't know, we're going to dress people up like Flavor Flav or something. That, that's the real black experience. And that's, that's what black people have to dress like. And the white people can dress like white people and the black people can dress like black people. And what Ralph Lauren has done is said, no, you know, I'm going to design tasteful clothing that is within the American tradition that has been worn before we all went crazy with identity politics that has been worn by white people and black people and all sorts of people. I'm just going to design clothing according to a standard of beauty and class and dignity. And then I'm going to say, this is the clothing for black people. As if to say, black people are not only Americans too, but black people are people too. They're capable of reason. They're capable of understanding standards of beauty. They're capable of dressing in a way that is dignified and uplifting because of course they are. Of course that's true. And everyone knew this was the case until what, 20, 30 years ago when the country went crazy with political correctness and multiculturalism. And, and now we're in a, living in a world where to pander to black people, Nancy Pelosi is wearing kente scarves. And, you know, she's two seconds away from, you know, putting her fist in the air and doing a performance of a Black Panther. It's, it's a very silly world that we're living in. It's very offensive to black people. It's not particularly good for standards of beauty and dignity. It's certainly not good for the American tradition, which that kind of ideology seeks to subvert. And Ralph Lauren comes in and he says, okay, you ready for my wild and crazy new style for black people? It's the same style I make for everyone else because it looks good. I love this. I totally love this. You, you've got sweaters that have, you know, the Morehouse logo or Spelman or Tuskegee. You could replace those letters with an H or a Y and a P and have it say Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. It would, it would be the same sweaters. They're saying, hey, guys, just dress nice, look good, recognize we're, we're all kind of part of this tradition here. We've, all, we've got a lot more in common and we should elevate ourselves, not abase ourselves as lots of cultures have done in recent decades. Absolutely great stuff. Well done, Ralph Lauren. Totally, totally love it. Speaking of racial issues, there is a major racial, racist hate crime incident at a Catholic high school in Rochester, according to the newspapers. You see, according to the newspapers, there was a graffiti incident at Our Lady of Mercy School for Young Women last week someone graffitied the N-word on a bathroom wall. And on the ba- it said, this school is filled with a bunch of N-words, not the words, you know, the people. Get out or else. And then, man, there were protests outside of this school. People were furious. And what happened? You already know what happened. I don't even need to tell you the conclusion of this story. Sensible people, people with two brain cells to rub together who have not been completely brainwashed by ideology, will look at that headline. They'll say, oh, it was a hoax. How dare you? Are you telling me racism doesn't exist? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, you know, the human heart is evil from its beginning, but 
beyond that base level of original sin in a fallen world. Yeah, racism is fake. It doesn't exist. The only legal racism is against whites and Asians in affirmative action and that sort of legal discrimination. But if you're telling me that this is a country run by Klansmen where lynchings are commonplace or exist at all, where crosses are burning on lawns, I'm going to tell you you're a complete lunatic and none of that is happening whatsoever. And so when we see these alleged incidents, we just know 999,999 times out of a million, they're going to be fake. And guess what happened? Guess what happened? A student confessed to writing the message. The student is remaining anonymous. Uh, She is being protected because she's a minor. But according to all of the reports, it's a black student. We cover these shows. We cover, cover these incidents all the time. I have a chapter of my book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, number one national bestseller, dedicated to incidents such as this. Why do these incidents happen? I don't think it happens necessarily because these kids are malicious. Maybe they are. They might be malicious. But more, I think they're deluded. I think they're trying to resolve a sort of cognitive dissonance. They are told that they live in a culture that hates black people, where whitey, where the patriarchy, where the man keeps them down, and where, as LeBron James says, a black person can't walk outside in America without being hunted down. So that's what they're told, and that's what they're taught from their earliest ages. That's what all students are taught. And then the reality does not conform to that delusion. And so what do they do? Do they change their delusions and opinions? No, they try to change reality. They go in and they say, oh, well, huh, I'm not see. people aren't taking racism seriously here because there isn't any of it. So I know what I'll do. I'll lie. I'll write, I'll, I'll create a hoax of a racist incident. And you know, it won't be honest in this case, but that lie will get to a greater truth because I know because of my ideology, I know that these incidents are happening all over the country and it's merely my misfortune that they're not happening at this school. So I could show everybody how horrible and racist America really is. So I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to get the ball rolling a little bit and just write this in. And that'll show, this lie will show them the truth. Of course it doesn't because all of these incidents that are allegedly happening that are forming their worldview are hoaxes. I, you see it really most clearly in our woman of the year, according to USA Today. The delusion says, I am a woman. But the mirror says, I am a man. The reality says, I am a man. So what are you going to do? Are you going to change your disordered thinking? Are you going to change your fantasy to bring it in line with reality? It would seem like that's the easiest thing to do. It's a lot cheaper and less painful than undergoing surgeries. No, we're going to try to change reality. That is the power of ideology. You see it working on young girls at a Catholic school in Rochester. You see it working on grown men who are somehow the assistant secretary of health. Now, speaking of violence, speaking of real violence, Russia has just fired a cruise missile into Western Ukraine. So you're seeing an escalation of the war there. It begins with troops around the border, then an incursion into the Eastern regions. Then you see the tanks rolling in, but not a ton of shelling. Then there's shelling, but they're trying to go after military targets. Then there's shelling of civilians. Now we've got cruise missiles just flying in the Russians. The Russians can be absolute animals in war. You see this throughout Russian history, most recently probably in the Second World War. You're starting to see that again in Ukraine. So Russia fires the cruise missiles in. But what's most interesting about this story is that the cruise missiles were apparently fired not from within Ukraine. They were fired from Russian territory. Why would Russia do this? Just to inflict destruction? Well, they could already do that. They've already got an army inside of Ukraine. Why do they need to fire a cruise missile from Russian airspace? They're doing that to put the final nail in the coffin of a no-fly zone imposed by the United States and NATO. Because the point of a no-fly zone is that you've got American fighter jets flying all overhead. And if any Russian airplane is in Ukrainian airspace, the Americans or NATO or whoever will shoot down that airplane. There can be no incursions on Ukrainian airspace. But Russia doesn't need to send the airplanes into Ukraine. Russia can hit Ukraine, even Western Ukraine, where this one hit, 
with missiles from Russia. So as the Pentagon observes, this means that a no-fly zone over Ukraine not only is not prudent, not only is there no appetite for it, really among the, the people broadly are supportive of it. I think it's three quarters of Americans surveyed said they want a no-fly zone, but very few people know what a no-fly zone really means. Very few people realize that a no-fly zone means the United States goes to war with Russia. And so among the people in power, including leftists and including right-wing hardcore Republicans, people are saying, no, we don't want a no-fly zone. Not only is it imprudent, it's ineffective. It won't do anything. Russia will just start firing the cruise missiles all the way to Western Ukraine from Russian airspace. They would seem to have Ukraine outfoxed and the West outfoxed here. There's nothing really that the West is going to do. Zelensky in Ukraine has already given up on Ukraine joining NATO. Presumably he's given up on Ukraine joining the European Union. NATO has said, we're not really going to do anything here. The United States won't even let the Poles send MiGs, send fighter jets to Ukraine. We won't even let Poland do that. So we're not going to do very much. And now Russia is saying, even if you wanted that no-fly zone, it's just not going to happen. This is why, from the beginning, I've said the oversimplistic view of this war, that it's the question of strategy is one between strength and weakness. Are we going to be strong in Ukraine or are we going to be weak in Ukraine? It doesn't, I don't think that really holds up. We are extremely weak in Ukraine right now. And the, the, the more strength we try to project, for instance, inviting Ukraine into NATO, for instance, inviting Ukraine into the European Union, for instance, antagonizing Russia, it hasn't actually made us any stronger. It's only weakened our position in Ukraine. And now what are we? Now we haven't really hurt Vladimir Putin all that much. Our gas prices are through the roof. He still is has by far the upper hand in Ukraine, and NATO looks impotent. We have these the way that we instituted these sanctions hasn't really even hurt Putin all that much. It's hurt Russians, it's hurt Americans, it's hurt Europeans, but it ha- and now by the way, we're about to do a deal with Iran because Joe Biden just loves this idea of doing a deal with Iran and putting them on the path to a nuclear weapon. So we're going to do the deal with Iran, and and that's going to allow Russia to skirt through the sanctions, because Russia is going to do business with Iran. So Iran signs on the dotted line for any business Russia wants to do, and now all of a sudden Russia doesn't need to worry about the sanctions. It's just really stupid policy, and Putin knew it, and Biden was outmatched, and that's just the way that it goes. It's very sad but it's true. Russia's been doing this for years, outfoxing not just America, but specifically the American left. The way they've done it specifically is by funding environmental groups in Europe, in the United States. Why would Russia fund environmental groups? Because it is in Russia's national interest to keep Russian oil and gas a a preeminent product in the world. They want to keep Europe and the United States hooked on Russian oil and gas. But they're not going to be able to do that very effectively if if Europe turns to other sources of energy, nuclear in particular, and if America starts drilling baby drill and fracking and pumping out oil. So what Russia has done, and this is confirmed not just by a lot of reporting, but by intelligence, take it with a grain of salt, is they have funneled money into non-governmental environmentalist organizations that have attacked those energy policies. And so Europe gives up its own energy. America stops drilling. America just focuses on the sun monster and Russia wins. And now you're in a position where even Joe Biden says, well, yeah, you know, look, we are getting a lot of our oil from Russia. We can try to turn it off now. Then we've got to go to Venezuela or we've got to go to Iran, but it's going to leave us weaker. And the American left cheers this on. Is it any wonder that Joe Biden would get outflanked. This is a guy who not only can't remember the name of his policies, not only can't remember the name of his staff, not only can't remember the name of his God, you know, you know the thing. He can't remember who he is himself. This is a guy who's been on the wrong side, not just of every domestic policy issue in recent years, but of every every single foreign policy issue. He's the guy who applauded. He said, a rising China is good for America. It's good for everyone. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. He was the guy who was so wrong on Russia that 
that President Zelensky in Ukraine is blaming Biden for the invasion. And this is being covered up by the media. But Zelensky said the fact that Biden took the sanctions off Russia's oil pipeline is the reason that Russia invaded. Is it any wonder that Putin is outfoxing him now? Who could have done better? I don't know. The last guy in office was pretty good. Donald Trump was able to govern for four years and Vladimir Putin did not encroach any further into other countries. Putin invaded Georgia under Bush. He invaded Ukraine under Obama. He stopped during Trump. He just kind of held off. And then he invades Ukraine more clearly during Joe Biden. So D- Donald Trump, the total idiot, incompetent, you know, this child in charge, we're headed for World War III. He did a much better job maintaining the world peace than Joe Biden does. And now Donald Trump has another crazy idea. He's hitting the campaign trail again. He's got this crazy idea at a rally that the left is pulling their hair out over. We will pass critical reforms, making every executive branch employee fireable. Fireable by the president of the United States, the deep state must and will be brought to heel. It's already happening. The deep state must and will be brought to heel. Does anyone disagree with that? What's the proposal is that people who work for the executive branch should be able to be fired by the head of the executive branch. I bet a lot of people listening to that rally would be surprised that that's not the case in America. What do you mean? You're telling me the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, can't fire people who work for him? Even just regular old little bureaucrats who work for him? We're not talking about the secretary of state even. We're just talking about like the guy in the mailroom. You can't fire that guy? No. And it's hard to fire that guy because the progressives a hundred years ago constructed a federal bureaucracy that basically just runs the country on its own, largely insulated from the electoral politics, from the will of the people, from the shifting winds in a democracy. So Trump says, no, I think we need to, we need to bring this bureaucracy back in line. The left says this, what a crazy maniac. That's how the country was run for most, most of our history, at least half of our history. And it hasn't been run recently, which is why you see this phenomenon of, of the uniparty. You know, whoever gets elected, for some reason, the national policy never changes. We just take out more and more debt. We invade more and more countries. We outsource more and more jobs. We lose more and more of our rights. Why is that? Republican, Democrat, Trump was able to impede it a little bit more, but still it just goes on and on and on. So Trump is coming in and he's running not even on an issue like oil, not even on an issue like immigration, as he did the first time. He's running on an issue about the government. He's saying there's a structural problem that's wrong in our government, and we need to fix that. Now, speaking of the deep state, there's a report that's just come out. It's from an anonymous former intelligence officer who now works for the Pentagon, who is claiming that Vladimir Putin has a terminal illness. He's suffering from terminal bowel cancer. The evidence for this is that his face is kind of puffy. His face is puffier than it was 20 years ago. Apparently, if you put on weight as you age, that's a sign that you are going to die. I guess you are going to die. We're we're all going to die someday. But this is the evidence that he's been enduring chemotherapy or that he's on steroids. Uh, This is their other evidence from the anonymous former intel officer. In the past, we've seen him smile. But in 2022, there are a few pictures of him looking happy. His look suggests he is in pain, and our people suggest his angry look is most likely as a result of him being in agony. Our people are confident he is ill. He's concerned about COVID, and he keeps the staff at a distance. The fact that the autocrat in Russia, as he is invading a sovereign nation, doesn't look so happy, that's your evidence that he's dying of cancer? Maybe Putin's dying of cancer. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But the evidence they're presenting is pretty weak. To me, it sounds like uh, some nonsense to make the West feel good, to make us feel like there's going to be an end to this thing and we don't need to do anything about it. But that's not the case. It sounds like happy thinking. It sounds like wish casting to me. And furthermore, when they say, well, he's, he's acting irrationally because he's got this disease, or maybe he's got some psychological disease, who knows, but he's acting irrationally. That's a way to avoid strategic thinking. 
Okay. And it's why we've done so poorly on this Russia issue, especially under Democrat administrations for 20, 30 years now. Instead of just saying, oh, he's a crazy person. How about you ask yourself, what does Putin want? What does this look like from Putin's perspective? What are Putin's priors? What is he? Because I bet he sees the world a lot differently than we do. What motivates him? What makes him tick? How can we best act to protect Ukraine, to protect Eastern Europe, to protect the West and the United States, and to avoid war and to rein in the ambitions of, of Putin? Because just calling him a madman and a crazy person and just antagonizing him without any effect, without any purpose, that doesn't seem to be working. That seems bad for Ukraine, seems bad for America, seems bad for Europe. For what? For what? To make us feel like we don't need to do the hard work of actually engaging. What is motivating these people? It's a, it's a, a silly report allegedly coming out of the intelligence community, but we've seen a lot of silly reports coming out of the IC for years and years now. The whole Russia hoax came out. Of, of the IC six years ago. There is some good news though. There is some good news coming out. It's a, a, actually a good way to end the show, especially on this day where we're launching the Fauci Unmasked series, which you can go check out at the Daily Wire. JP Morgan Chase, major, major bank, is ending its employer vaccine mandate. They sent a memo to employees observed by Bloomberg, largest bank in the country, so they will stop the practice of mandatory testing for workers without the vaccine starting on April 4th. They will end the requirement for employees to start rep to report COVID-19 cases. Masking will be optional for all staff, vaccinated or unvaccinated, starting immediately. Why is this happening? This is happening because the people have pushed back. This is happening because the polls reflect that this is not, this is, there is no change in the science. The science is exactly the same as it has always been. But the politics has changed. The people have pushed back. Companies such as the Daily Wire, not to toot our own horn, have sued the federal government, have sued Biden and won. The Democrats are looking ahead to November. They realize this is not very popular. Anthony Fauci has been put in the witness protection program and people want to forget all the terrible things he did to our country over the last two years and actually even further back than that. They're going to retreat for a while, but I think it's a tactical retreat. I think it's a strategic retreat because in the long run, I don't think that the government has given up any of this power. I don't think the quasi-governmental elites in the so-called private sector have given up this power. I think they could bring it back unless we just say no. Unless we say no to this clown world, we call a spade a spade. We don't pretend that men are women. We don't pretend that abortion is health care. We don't pretend that criminals are victims. We don't pretend that we're living in the upside down. We still have a country. We can still govern ourselves. We the people still have rights if we don't let them slip through our fingers. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Today on The Ben Shapiro Show, stagflation may be coming, according to former Clinton Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, but Biden's going to keep spending all the money. Plus, the Russian assault on Ukraine continues, and we may be watching in real time the reshaping of world financial markets. All of that is on today's Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. Listen.